willkommen in Berlin. Hello and welcome to Berlin. This is Marion Jones and this is City Breaks Berlin, episode 10, Three Big Art Galleries. Berlin is quite a confusing place, art gallery-wise. There are three massive galleries, all of which, it turns out, are slightly different. They're organised chronologically. If you want to see everything from, say, medieval German paintings, right up to things that were produced after the end of World War II, then you'd need to visit all three. So, I'm intending in this episode to explain what they are and what exactly you can expect to find in each of them. Some people will pick out the one they most want to visit, others might go to them all, but at least you'll be informed. At least I hope so. OK, so the three are the Gemälde Gallery, which translates as Gallery of Paintings. Then there's the Alte National Gallery, the Old National Gallery, and, yes, you've guessed it, the Neue National Gallery, the New National Gallery. So let's take them in chronological order, starting with the one with the oldest works in it, and that is the Gemälde Gallery, part of the Kulturforum, that modern cultural area built after the wall came down, just along from Potsdamer Platz. Here you will find over 3,000 works of art, exhibited chronologically in, I think it's 53 different little rooms. They're separated by epoch, by genre of art, all very nice and orderly. It's a collection which began in the 19th century and, confusingly, was originally held in what is now called the Alte National Gallery. And when it was set up, it was to be the German National Gallery, a comprehensive collection of, yes, plenty of German works, but also of the best from across the other countries. And the aim at the time was said to be to create a collection which would, quote, first delight and then teach. Under the German Empire, the collection grew, became firmly established, but then, of course, in the mid-20th century, because of World War II, everything was disrupted. Most of the works were taken into hiding in salt mines in Thuringen, in East Germany, and many of those survived the war. Some of the larger ones, which it was difficult to move, were hidden in a bunker in Berlin and later destroyed by the Soviets. After the war, the whole collection was broken up. Some of it remained in what became East Germany. Much of it was taken by the Americans to a central collection point in that vast post-war project aimed at returning art to Jewish owners from whom it had been stolen. The whole division of the city, East and West Berlin, added further complications, and to cut a long story short, it wasn't until after the war came down, so after 1989, that the collections were put back together as far as that was possible. Some were kept on Museum Island in their original home, I'll come back to that later, and the rest had a brand new home built for them in the Kultur Forum, opened nine years after the wall came down in 1998. So then, today, in the Gemälde Gallery, you will find an astonishing range of artwork from the 13th century up until the 18th century. Everything newer than that is elsewhere. It's a wide collection, lots of European masters. Think Botticelli, Rembrandt, Rubens, Titian, but also a collection of German artwork. And since it would be impossible to cover everything, it's on that that I'm going to focus. In fact, the first few rooms in the museum are devoted to German art. And what a treat when you first walk in. If, like me, you're a fan of those sumptuous medieval paintings, altarpieces, bright colours, lots of gold, innocent little figures, then you will love it here. There are lots and lots of religious paintings, biblical scenes, the birth of Christ, the adoration of the kings, Madonna and child, Christ washing the apostles' feet, the Last Supper, the crucifixion, and they are from different areas of Germany and all labelled as such, so if you want to go into it in detail, you can compare what was being done where and by whom. Many of these were by artists whom I didn't know, and I'm going to just mention three of the more famous ones whose work you can also see here. So, one, Ants Holbein the Older, painter, woodcut designer, goldsmith, a man who had travelled all through Europe studying church paintings and then returned to Augsburg to start his own workshop. He did paint lots of altarpieces and other paintings on a religious theme. For example, Maria als Schmerzensmutter, which is translates into English as The Morning Virgin, a beautiful painting showing Mary 
cloaked in black or maybe very dark blue, one golden star to relieve the dark colours, her hands folded in prayer. Hans Holbein the Older was one of the main artists of his day, but he was eventually eclipsed by his son, Hans Holbein the Younger, who was the one who went to England, painted for the Tudors, did those famous paintings of Henry VIII and so on that you see in textbooks everywhere. Another very famous German artist whom you'll see here is Albrecht Dürer, painter, printmaker, particularly well known for his woodcuts of animals and of allegorical scenes such as the night, death and the devil. He too had a sort of apprenticeship, his Wanderjahre as they were called, so his wandering years when he travelled to North Germany, to Italy, to see what was being done and to learn from other artists. So here in the collection, you'll find a painting called Beaten de Maria. So, Mary at prayer, a calm figure in a blue cloak with rather colourful linings, little tints of orange and pink. And there are portraits too, which give you a real flavour of the 15th and 16th centuries. One of Hieronymus Holtschuer, for example, painted in about 1526, a 57-year-old member of Nuremberg Town Council. Just his head and shoulders, long grey hair, grey beard, plain brown cloak, a picture of an important elder statesman who is gazing straight out at you from 500 years ago. And paintings too by Lucas Cranach, Lucas Cranach the Elder, that is. He's the one who did portraits of Martin Luther. Again, you might have seen those in history books. He did lots of paintings and woodcuts, produced altarpieces, did portraits. He was based in Wittenberg, where Martin Luther pinned his 95 theses to the church door. And he painted a number of altarpieces for Lutheran churches. He also became the court painter to the Saxon court. And he too had a painter son, although in this case it was the father who was the more famous of the two. So, paintings of his which you can see here include some religious ones. Die Ruhe auf die Flucht nach Ägypten, so literally, Rest on the Flight to Egypt, painted in about 1504, showing the baby Jesus on Mary's lap, the family have stopped under a fir tree to rest, and angels are visiting them, one's offering the baby a strawberry. So a very human moment. Here too is his Judgment of Solomon, a graphic depiction of that very dramatic moment when Solomon says, the way to decide or to solve the argument between the two mothers is to cut the baby in half. There's a painting too of Adam and Eve in paradise and portraits, a scholar's wife and one called Cardinal Albrecht von Brandenburg. And there is a very curious and memorable painting called Der Jungbrunnen or in English The Fountain of Youth in which he shows elderly women being led through a pool and coming out the other side rejuvenated. So those are some of the highlights from the German collection here at the Gemälde Gallery. There's lots more there, divided up mainly by country, rooms for Dutch and Flemish and English paintings, other rooms for French, Italian, Spanish, absolutely treasure-packed. But I'm going to stop there with the end of the German collection and move on to my second art gallery in Berlin, the Alte Galerie on Museum Island which sort of carries on, chronologically speaking, from the Gemälde Gallery, because here you will find paintings and sculptures mainly from the 19th century. It's an interesting building, first built as an art museum, used in 1936 for one of Hitler's showpiece events, the Olympic torch ceremony, which opened the Berlin Olympics. So picture that when you look at the steps, Hitler standing at the top, and the last runner in the relay racing up the steps to hand him the flame. So, in the great reorganisation that happened after the end of World War II and then after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of the city, it was decided to move all the older paintings to the Kulturforum, as just described, and to keep this one as the home for later collections, everything it was said from the French Revolution up until the First World War, so a broad span, including all of the 19th century. Again, lots and lots of stuff here, but I'm going to focus on the German. And start with paintings from the Romantic era. Well-known painters include Karl Friedrich Schinkel. You'll hear a lot about him. He was an architect who designed some of the city's finest 19th century buildings, but he was also a designer and a painter. There's lots of his work in other places in Berlin, 
for example at Charlottenburg. But here, one of his most striking paintings, the Goetische Dom am Wasser, so a Gothic cathedral at the water's edge, painted in 1813, an imaginary cathedral on a waterside, a romantic ideal. Young people are frolicking at the waterside. There are dramatic Gothic spires of the cathedral in the background, all set against a blue and white sky with the sun just breaking through the clouds. And perhaps the best known German romantic painter, Caspar David Friedrich. Several of his works here. He was known for his romantic landscapes. Contemplative figures silhouetted against night skies, that sort of thing. Some morning mists, some bare trees, Gothic ruins, a favourite of his. He painted, I read somewhere, human helplessness against the forces of nature. There are a number of his tree paintings here, for example, Abtei im Eichwald, so Abbey in an Oak Forest, a dramatic ruin, possibly in a graveyard, bare trees in a winter landscape, grey and white and the faintest touch of pink up in the sky. Then there's Der Einsamer Baum, the lonely tree, a gnarled old tree in the foreground, more trees and hills and sky in the background, and Eichbaum im Schnee, the oak tree in the snow, another gnarled tree against a blue sky and a snowy white ground. But plenty of paintings with people in them too, for example, Zwei Männer am Meer, two cloaked figures gazing out to sea. A vast, largely grey sea, lots of grey sky in the background, and again a slight relief of a little bit of pink, a winter early evening, I'd say. There's another one called Moon Rising Over the Sea, which shows three figures with their backs to us, sitting on a huge rock, gazing out at boats and sea, sky, moon, ripples and reflections. All very contemplative. As well as the romantic paintings, you'll see lots of works which illustrate German culture in one way or another. For example, there are some scenes with titles like Unter den Linden, so of the main street in Berlin, Unter den Linden, and another one of the Neue Wache in Berlin, both of these painted by one Edward Gärtner. There's a portrait of the Brothers Grimm, one of the few by a female artist, Elisabeth Baumann, and quite a lot of royal portraits. There's one of Kaiser Franz from Austria, for example, and a number of works by Adolf Menzel, who painted throughout the middle and end of the 19th century and was particularly known as a historical painter. So there are pictures by him, for example, of a flute concert at the court of Frederick the Great at Sanssouci, showing the royals and their guests in about 1850. From 1871, a picture showing King William setting off to war, and painted at around the same time another big lively court scene showing ball goers surrounded by tables laden with food and drink and glittering lights, all very royal and grand. And lastly, I'm going to mention one more painting by a female artist. Dora Hitz. She often painted women, and there's one here called Kirschen Ernte, which means the cherry harvest, from about 1900, showing a group of women cherry pickers stopping for a rest. Some of them have got their small children with them, and there's a little scene playing out where a man is harassing one of them. He's got his arm around her waist, and her face is saying very much, No, thank you, go away. The sort of painting you imagine could only be painted by a woman. OK then, so that's a flavour of the second gallery. And the third one I want to mention is the Neue National Gallery, the new National Gallery. This one isn't on Museum Island, it's back over near the Kultur Forum. And it's the place to go if it's 20th century art that you want to see. Or rather art painted up to and just after the Second World War. Quite an amazing building, designed by the architect Mies van der Rohe, who was a visionary. He wanted to create an open space as free as possible of supports, and that certainly is what you see when you walk in. The vast acreage of the entrance hall is quite overwhelming. Not a painting in sight. I believe it is actually used for temporary exhibition sometimes, but when I went it was just empty, 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 with an admissions desk hidden in one corner. It's a steel and glass structure, so very open, full of light, only eight slender pillars holding the whole thing up. And the art, it turns out, is mainly hidden downstairs. And there you will find a collection of 20th century art, so post-Empire German art, through the early part of the century, the golden twenties, 
the National Socialist period, World War II and the Holocaust. Again, I am going to focus on the German work in the collection, although there are plenty of other things too. Work by Edward Munch, for example, the Norwegian Expressionist painter, Salvador Dali and other Surrealist works. But, sticking with the German, early on you will find Expressionism represented. An important movement in the German art world, a move away from Impressionism, an emphasis on not painting what you see, but painting things to express inner feelings. So you might use unexpected colours or unusual perspectives. Perhaps there wouldn't be the detail that you were expecting in earlier types of painting. There are some Franz Marc paintings here, notably Drei Pferde, so three horses, painted in 1913, when said horses are grey and a creamy yellow colour and red, all against a blue and green background representing land and sky. So brightly coloured and anything but naturalistic. There's some Vasily Kandinsky as well. For example, his sketch called Reiter, Riders, from 1909, which shows a horse and rider again emerging in bold shapes and bright colours. There's a section of paintings done just after World War I, which, as you can imagine, is very arresting. For example, a large painting called Flanders by Otto Dix. Otto Dix had fought in World War I, he'd won an Iron Cross, and afterwards he was deeply traumatised. So this picture of Flanders shows the battle in all its reality. Bodies huddled together, when you look at them you're not quite sure whether they're dead or alive, and the whole thing is a sea of browny green is it uniforms, mud all mixed up, bits of twig, barbed wire, really the miserable chaos of life in a trench in 1914. He did other paintings too, referring to the aftermath of war and what it had done to the people who'd been involved in it. One of his famous paintings, which is here, is called Die Skatspieler. So Skat is a German card game, and this was based, apparently, on a scene which Otto Dix had actually witnessed of three disabled war veterans playing cards in a cafe. A very moving scene of three people for whom life is never going to be normal again, trying nevertheless to do something every day, such as playing a game of cards with a couple of friends. There's another painting by Joseph Schall called Eke Homo. So here, this is man, deliberately a weighty Latin title, because that contrasts with what you see when you look at the picture which is a man whose face has been disfigured. He's wearing a uniform, or the tattered remains of one anyway, and his face is half blurred out of existence with splodges of paint, quite grotesque, and a comment on what the war had done to the people who were forced to take part in it. On a similar theme, there's a painting called The Pillars of Society by George Gross, painted in 1926, nightmarish characters of the elite classes of Germany, the businessmen, the clergy, the generals. The title, ironic, these people who should be the pillars of society hadn't managed to avert the crisis of the war. There's another George Gosch painting too here called Grey Day, which sets society's winners and losers against each other. So there's an industrial worker, very gloomy, downtrodden figure, and an amputee war veteran, and alongside them a bourgeois German who's trotting along quite happily, seemingly oblivious to the plight of the others. A bit later in the collection, you come to the 1930s, and a lot of information about the attitude of Hitler and the Nazis to art. For example, there's something about an exhibition which took place in 1933 of Entartete Kunst, translated as degenerate art. This was an exhibition which the Nazis devised, which toured the country, was shown in Berlin, as well as elsewhere, and which took at its theme all the sorts of works which were no longer going to be tolerated. There were thousands of them which had been removed from German art galleries. Some were sold abroad, but many were destroyed. 5,000 were burnt on one occasion in Berlin in 1939. There's information too about a radio broadcast which Hitler gave in 1937, railing against modern art, complaining about works in an exhibition of that year called the Great German Art Exhibition. Some artists were so horrified after hearing his words that they fled the country. 
Many people heard the message that their ideology was now undesirable. So artists, museum staff, teachers at the art academies left the country, fled abroad, often to America, although there were some exceptions. Karl Kuntz, for example, remained in Germany all through the 1940s, painting in his father's carpentry workshop. He was working largely in secret, and if trouble arrived, the wrong sort of people arrived at the workshop, he simply turned his paintings round and got on with some carpentry. It was under these conditions that he painted the well-known Germany Awake, which was inspired by Picasso's Guernica. And the last paintings in the gallery here are from the post-war period, again often depictions of trauma and disconnection. There's one, for example, by Max Ernst, painted in the 1940s, which I think is a picture of a disturbed mind, really. It's called Young Man Troubled by the Flight of a Non-Euclidean Fly. And it shows a face in the middle. It's quite hard to tell whose face it is. It's sort of a bit like a person, but it could be a wolf or some other strange creature. It's painted in strange colours, blues and greens and purple. And all around it are lines in oval shapes, representing, I imagine, the fly's flight path. Sort of the effect is of a buzzing in the head that just won't go away. Somebody who can't think straight anymore. Max Ernst was of that generation so badly affected by 20th century German history. He lost two of his artist friends in the First World War, August Macker and Franz Mark. He fought in the war himself. When he came home to Germany, he founded the Dada movement. But in 1941, he was one of those artists who could take it no longer and who emigrated to America, became a refugee from the war. And I think for me, the most memorable painting in the whole of this section was one called Nacht über Deutschland, Night over Germany, painted just after the war, 1945-6, to six, I think, by Horst Strempel. It's in the same format as a traditional altarpiece, so three paintings, a central one, and then one attached to each side, but, of course, a completely different style and I found completely unforgettable. So it's mainly in grey colours. It shows a group of thin, angular bodies huddled together, distressed faces, hollow eyes. In the central panel is a group of concentration camp survivors. You can see their tattoos on their arms, the serial numbers. In the right-hand panel you see a father holding his wife and son. The original sketch for that part shows that they were originally wearing yellow stars, but that the artist painted them out, because at that time, so soon after the war, references to the Holocaust were thought, quote, undesirable. So, I hope I've given the idea that the whole of German painting from medieval days right up until post-World War II is available to be seen in Berlin. It is organised chronologically, but you do have to know what is where and what eras each of these three galleries I've mentioned cover. It is a bit tricky discussing visual art, trying to give people who haven't seen the paintings perhaps a sense of what there is, but I hope I've managed it. If you've enjoyed this episode, by the way, perhaps you'd like to know that there are episodes on art galleries in most, if not all, of the other City Break series. There's a whole episode devoted to the Uffizi Gallery in the Florence series, for example. Episodes on the main galleries in Munich and St. Petersburg in the next two series. There's an episode in the Toulouse series called Art and Architecture. One on the Fine Arts Museum in Seville. Several episodes each, I think, in the Paris and London series. And a tour of Edinburgh's main galleries too. So, do go and have a look if that's of interest to you. We are continuing the art theme in the next Berlin episode. I couldn't squeeze it all into today. And next time I'm going to have a look at a variety of things, starting with an artist and an art movement, who both have galleries devoted to them, so that would be Keta Kolwitz, in the case of the artist, and the Bauhaus movement. And then I'm planning a skate round a number of other places in Berlin, where there's yet more art on offer. Modern art, street art, that sort of thing. So I hope very much that you'll be up for joining me for that. And meanwhile, I would just like to thank you very much for listening. Vielen Dank fürs Zuhören. And to wish you goodbye. Until next time. Bis zum nächsten Mal. Auf Wiederhören. Musik